This is for the action takers, creators, status quo challengers, those in love with the process, hungry for knowledge and questioning everything, here to optimize today and fulfill the potential of tomorrow. Why? Because it's in our nature. Welcome to the Pure Sport Project with your hosts, Grayson Hart and James Dollar. Welcome back uh, to the Pure Sport Project. It's a bloody honour to have our guest today, Ben Earl. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Bloody good to have you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your journey to date, who you are, uh, in your own words. So I'm a rugby player, first and foremost. Um, grew up in South London. Um, started playing rugby at... 10 11 years old uh um, amongst a load of other sports and yeah um been at saracen since i was 14 in the academy uh come all the way through had the honor of playing for england um we've made my full debut at the age of 21 in 2020 and yeah never haven't really looked back so just enjoying playing representing my boyhood club and, and trying to you know trying to make my way in the world as it is with that and was it always your dream to be a professional rugby player? No, definitely not. Uh, there was a few things that came before. I wanted to be in the army, wanted to be a spy. Uh, then I went to my parents at around 16 and I just played for England 16s. Thought I was the best thing since sliced bread and, and said, oh, look, I want to want to be a rugby player. And they they actually laughed. They said, no way. Um, what a waste of a, of an education. What a waste of you know, working so hard to put me through school and whatever. Um, and then I think it became more of a realistic dream as as I got older, I got to 17, got to 18, kept playing for my England age group teams. And and it became a little bit more of a conversation when Saracens turned around 18 and said, look, we'd like to offer you a contract. And I think they probably didn't know there was a career there for me. And yeah, I haven't really looked back since. So uh, not always, but um, probably from when I was 17, 18, definitely it's just been the sole focus, yeah. And something that not everyone may know about you, but you managed to complete your degree full time whilst training as a professional rugby player. Well, that was one of the conditions that my parents had with me. So they were like, look, you can do this, but that this career could end in two years. And the first contract I had was two years. Uh, and they said, look, you, you've got to do a degree whilst you're doing that. Um, I was like, yeah, yeah, fine, whatever. Just, just let me sign this deal. Um, Little did I know the work it would require, the commitment. Um, it was bloody hard work, but it was it was really rewarding by by the end of that. How did you manage that? The training around the lectures did it not clash at the same well, times? So the, I don't know if it's the same with everyone, but like you'd pick modules, and it would normally tell you what days those lectures were on. So I could normally guess that around a Wednesday I'd have a day off. So I'd used to pick my modules on lectures that were on Wednesdays even if I had no idea what it was so I was like I'm doing that one and every now and again it would clash and I'd have to like miss training and be like can I just beat down to East London uh to to make a lecture or make a seminar um and then yeah so it was cool about like forward planning knowing what your week held kind of the week next so um so the coach had enough time in advance to 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 make up the numbers and training and whatever so it was tough it required a lot of probably more planning than an 18, 19 year old normally does. So, but like it stand me in good stead and, and, and haven't really looked back since. Was that three full-time years? Of so three full-time years. Uh, I was quite lucky that my last year um, was solely dissertation. So I had did one module in the first term and then the other two terms were solely dissertation. So I could kind of have a little bit more of a virtual relationship with my tutor and just keep sending him stuff. And I was blessed. I mean, I, I don't know, but like I, kept sending him the work and he basically just keep like adding little bits he's like i reckon you should put this in here's exactly what i'd put and it was like six or seven lines of text i was like copy and paste well, perfect must have been a bloody series <laughs> yeah. fan, eh? i was like this is genius don't say we'll edit that but <laughs> you're gonna claim the um, the so video. yeah so i was like that was great and then uh yeah managed to kind of steal a 2-1 and, and ran off with it and that, and that was it really and were saracens from when you look at it from the outside and and I know throughout my rugby career there was a lot of talk about how Saracens as a club is really driven to like create rounded 
people and not just rugby players and they look at that as part of their success is that has that been your experience of the club and and was were they obviously clear and aware that your ambition was to complete your degree full time and did they sort of live those values what yeah so like? so when you first sign your academy contract one of the conditions is that you get paid X, but a, a slice of that is going towards an education. So that could be from, in my case, a degree to, in other people's case, they were doing plumbing degrees or electricity stuff. Um, so like that was massively important. Um, but, you know, the club, the club claims and always prides itself on being a people first club, um, treat people well, and they tend to work unbelievably hard is, is a big saying at the club. And I mean, as you get older, you realize how special the place is in terms of the self-sustaining culture and the the trips that we get to go on in the middle of the season, which is like crazy. And um, yeah, I've, I've found that that is definitely a big thing. And I think, you know, the more, the more you're closer with your teammate, the more you're closer with your coach, the more you're willing to work for him. And I'm sure you guys have found that here, but the bigger relationship you have off the pitch, the better you're going to perform for that person on it. 100%. And while you were there at, at uh, university, you were obviously racking up a few games for the Saracens. Um, did you get a bit of special treatment from like the chicks and were like the boys wanting you to come down the pub and like, were they like, oh, yeah, yeah. What um, was that like? It, was, it, was, it wasn't quite like that. I mean, like what I found is that like doing the degree I did, there was actually quite a lot of, um, <laughs> quite a lot of girls in the, in the course. So it'd be like, a lot of the people I was living with, the players well, I was living with, the they'd, by they'd, your days be like, <laughs> they'd be like, oh, look, look, is there a uni night that your, your mates are going to go to? Because the boys I was living with, rugby players, are like, all like, yeah, let's go for a uni night. So like, I was kind of there in for the uni night. But um, but no, yeah, it was uh, it was actually a really, really th fun couple of years. I was living in a house of like six lads. We were all kind of doing different bits of studying, doing nights out in the middle of the week that we definitely shouldn't have been doing, and then playing for your loan club or the club at the weekend. So it was like a... No week was the same and it was it was just a really enjoyable time. So you said you were at Saracens from the age of 14, um, but I know you got uh, a little stint at Amptill. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And one of the boys that used to work here, young William Googe, used to play there as well. Heard he was quite a beefcake back then as well, compared to his skinny runner self now. Have you got any uh, any dirt on Amptill or what it was like it to was, play there? He was really, he was really, really good. He was really good. Um, probably he will always damn play it, but he was, he was like an athletic direct 12 um he had a few fallouts with the coach Paul Turner like a, a sh like an aggressive welshman um you know obviously like you come come into training it's pretty uh it's pretty gritty there it's quite wet it's quite muddy you know he's probably had a day in the shoots so he's like didn't want to get the face too too dusted up but the thing about Amto is that they call themselves the mob right so you'd have like we I remember this game at Hull we both played me and Will and uh the thing was, you get the bus there, it'd be very professional. Um, you know, obviously everyone's got their game faces on. And then the way back, you've never seen something like it. It's it's bizarre. You've got like 40-year-old men absolutely losing the plot. You've got Will Googe. You've got me, who's like, I'm like, what is going on? I'm trying to work out how to get back from Amptill to St. Albans, which is like a 45-minute journey. And I've had about 39 lagers in, on the way back from Hull. Um, yeah, no, it's just it was great fun. And like, we still stay in touch now and look back on those years very fondly he was like I say he was he was he was a very very good player and um obviously now he's doing his own thing and but he was athletic and fast and very skilled how did you find it there did you find that because you'd come from such a big club and then you were kind of earning your stripes at a lower league club did you find there was much resistance or were you welcomed because they were like you're actually going to add a lot of value to the team I felt welcomed I definitely felt welcomed but you know, there's also like um an element of like a responsibility to be like we were challenged when we went on loan to be like the best player on the pitch. You know, you're playing against guys who have a day job nine to five and my day job nine to five was just to be, to play rugby. So, you know, you, you were meant to be one of the best players on the pitch. And, you know, I was up and down with that as, as a youngster and, but definitely stood me in good stead along the way in terms of, you have to socialize with people from, from all different walks of life. Um, they had a very strong Tongan community at Amptill and, um, you know, run by a, a Welshman and, you know, people that you wouldn't normally meet in your in your day job. So um, I, I thought it was unbelievably useful, 
you, you certainly learned how to drink a few lagers that was for sure so there was a few bits like that but no I, I loved it and like still stay in touch with guys I played with then so it was, it was a great time was that like your first taste of men's rugby yeah that was yeah. so it was my first senior so like are you playing the academy you play against 18 year olds every now and again you get like a second team game but it's not quite the same and then all of a sudden you're in like we, we call it the wild west so like there's no tmo there's no you know sometimes the touch judges are, are coaches so like they're not going to call anything so you've got this one ref he's only got two eyes you're on the other side of the rock you're, you're wearing a little bit i tell you what you're wearing something um, whether that's a boot to the face or a, or a quick punch but l thankfully we had one of the biggest teams around so people weren't doing that to us but yeah like i said it was it was a really like good education for me in terms of not only as a rugby player, but also like as a human, like the humility that how lucky we had it in terms of, you know, things are given to us as professional players, right? Yeah, food made, whatever. All of a sudden you come to these games and it's like people are coming opening Sainsbury's meal deals because that's all they are willing to afford on food and whatever. And you're like, right, I need to really take what I have for granted and, and that kind of stuff. A real slice of humble pie. It is, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I you've ate got a few of those. Play. Yeah, exactly. I remember my first season and I was coming from school and I was like, yeah, I'm all right. Like I'm yeah. the heavier side of schoolboy rugby. I went to men's rugby and just got bounced yeah, around for the first six months. Yeah. Pond, it's like ridiculous, <laughs> isn't it? It's crazy. I think that's a tough challenge for a young, obviously when you're at one of those top flight clubs like Saracens, you've made it through all those uh, age grade with England. That's, a, that's a, a great challenge to take on, but it's a tough challenge, isn't it? To be expected by Saracens to be one of the top performing players on that field. I think it's amazing that they're pushing you for that standard, but a lot of people don't realize that that is a very different style of rugby. It's a tough game. The lower leagues you go, I mean, I, 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 I'm obviously never reached the levels of rugby that, of your, your um, caliber, but I was fortunate I played in the top tier my whole career. And in the last couple of years, I went down to the championship. My mindset was, so naive i thought oh okay there's gonna be a level below i'm gonna carve up it was the opposite it was actually so much harder to perform so how how was that for you like was there times of frustration were there times you doubted yourself or did you absolutely just tear it up <laughs> no it, definitely in terms of like eye-opening i mean i was very similar to you i was naive i was like look these guys they work in the city or you know they do whatever and and then they turn up on a Saturday or on a Tuesday night to train. But the, most of those guys you play with are like, would have been good enough to make it if, if they wanted to. So like, that's the kind of level. So it's like, these guys are as good as anyone. They just don't want to put in the time and effort or they just don't fancy doing it every day, which is completely fair enough. So, you know, you definitely had your pants pulled down a few times. And, and then you've got these humongous blokes who like, you know, are just genetically freak, freakish, but, you know, might not be as skillful. But my goodness, when you get hit, you stay hit in those in those in those bits um but yeah like it's definitely um in terms of when you first start out it's a bit of like a school of hard knocks kind of thing it's like survival of if you can get through that first two or three years you'd normally be all right it's just such a tough time like you're fending for yourself you haven't got your mum cooking your food every day you kind of got to work out how to cook a chicken breast and then you've got to go and train against billy vanapola like the next day so it's like gosh what am i what am i doing and then you know, if you're honest, you get the shit kicked out of you in the in the club, and you know you you you're challenged by, you know, you're, you're defending against Owen Farrell, the guy who's done achieved it all, and you you're, you've literally come out of school, and you know the best thing you've done is is win your house cup at school. Do you know what I mean? So like you you at two very different ends of the spectrum, and it's it's a real sink or swim kind of thing. And there, are, yeah, I remember days where you'd come home from training and you'd be like, I am miles off it like i'm never going to make it at this and then and then eventually you work out you play the game you keep going because all the coaches want to see it you and they're not expecting you to to be tearing up they just want to see the fight they want to see the mentality of coming again coming again and yeah eventually you catch up it's like you learn by assimilation do you know what i mean like you're if you're close enough to these guys all the time you you get to their level eventually with the hard work so you know it, it's it's really really tough but it's really rewarding as well was there any particular player in those early days that you were surrounded by and you were like, there was one picture or one person in your mind that you kind of looked at and thought, actually, they're leading the way here. I'm going to follow them by example and use them as a role model for me to uh, like enhance your own career. I think there's two people. I think firstly, Maro Otoje. So like Maro Otoje is like the, the, the diamond product of like any academy system. Like he is, he was by far and the best, the best player from when he was 14 but like 
with that, he was the, he's the most professional bloke, even to this day. It's crazy how professional he is. So like we always used to get drummed into us, you know, oh, Marrow did this, Marrow did that. So there was definitely a lot of that in terms of like, right, what's Marrow doing and what did he do that I, I can do within my power? So that's like getting your nutrition right, watching training back the moment you get home, you know, studying so that you have a bit of perspective on life, etc. So he was he was probably off pitch. And then on pitch, I was lucky enough to have Scott Berger playing for, for Saracens as I joined. He's like, what, an 80-cap Springbok, won the best player in the world twice, you know, came back from a near-death experience to, like, play, play in a World Cup again, which is just incredible. Um, and, like, watching him work and train he wasn't necessarily the best professional back then and he's probably he'd be the first to admit that i mean he was doing like a couple of lagers every night a couple of wines i mean to the point where he like he almost took me a little bit under his wing and was like look mate like you come over for some dinner and stuff and you'd offer you a lager and you know if scott burger offers you a lager you're having a lager do you know what i mean he's gonna um, smoke you at yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, he, but by the way yeah exactly that you like he you may be on his side when you're sitting at the dinner table that night but when you're wearing a bib and he's training at the weekend he's taking your head off so um but like just watching how those great guys work is like is just eye-opening and you like you can almost fruit pick you know those little bits from each person and try and make it your own as it were the I heard you mention before that when you went out on loan and you saw the reality of, you know, some of these guys and what they're giving uh, to, you know, bring their own means together to get their food before the games and some of the conditions that you guys were training in. Yeah. And the thing I heard from you is it actually instilled like a gratitude for what you, the the facilities, the opportunity that you did have at Saracens and to make the most of that. Is that something that you were taught, like as a as a kid, to look in that way, or uh, is it something that you developed or learned? Because I know, for for example, there will be a lot of people that come from a top flight club that get loaned, and I've seen it firsthand, and they're in disgust. They don't want to yeah, be yeah. there, and the attitude is like, "This sucks," you know. So how how did you have that outlook? That I think you? I think if we're honest, I'll be the first to admit I certainly had that at the beginning. I was like, "Whoa, you know, this isn't." this is now it's meant to be. I'm only, what, two two divisions down from where I'm wanting to be playing and I'm watching this. And then you're like, but it's working because they're playing really well. They're training really well. They're happy. Like, they're happy just playing. I think that's what it, that's the biggest thing it instilled in me was like the gratitude of being able to play rugby is like huge. Like, there are guys at the clubs around the leagues that will maybe play two, three games a year and train train their nuts off and, and not get a break. I was lucky enough to be sent on loan and actually get to play rugby, the thing I'm paid to do. Um, so you all of a sudden you have a sense of identity. Nothing else really matters. You like you work out what what works for you, and I think that's as much as the point of sending you on loan is like not just the education on the pitch, like education off it. Like right, I didn't get my nutrition right that week. I probably didn't play as well as I could. I didn't train as well as I could. How do I how do I grow myself? How do I get better at that kind of stuff? And it's all a it's all a learning curve until you get to this point now and you 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 you're now it's now ingrained in you as second nature. Like I've got a game on Saturday night. What does that mean for my nutrition? You know, almost you're almost thinking about that three days prior now. So like come Thursday afternoon, all my focus is on how can I peak Saturday night. Now whether that means I don't eat Thursday night, it, it won't. But whether that you know for someone that might not mean I might not eat all for all of Friday, for example. But it's just working out what works for you and what to eat. Is that something that you've kind of pursued yourself, or is it something that's encouraged via Saracens, or is it a combination of both? Probably a combination of both. So we have a nutritionist, um, and you know he's always available to to give you hints and tricks. But like. It, it, at the same time like every person's body is different like I, we were speaking about earlier i don't like eating before games so this weekend i've got a game at 8 p.m uh, at home so i've got to kind of work out how i'm going to feel good in my, within myself but still manage to eat because there's no way i can't eat between nine getting up in the morning and 8 p.m so um it's just about how that works so like but you work out what works for you and you have some you know, we've all had some pretty torrid times where we've got it wrong, either both way, like you've had the caffeine rush and it gets to half time and you literally can't even lift your head up. You know, you're that you've you've gone into that much of a dip or you've run out of the pitch and you're like, God, I've eaten way too much here and you like you feel sluggish. So it's like trial and error until to the point where like, you know, you've nailed it, you know exactly how it's gonna work each time. So yeah. And not long after your loan spell, uh, you know, running 
10 minute walk from the those humble changing rooms at Ampdor along that muddy path out to that field uh what within a couple years you managed to make your test debut um one of the phrases that we love here at pure sport uh is sometimes the best way to do it is just to do it and and i think what you're saying there around going out and get get the opportunity to go on own and just play rugby is something that a lot of the top tier like academy kids the best way to develop is playing um what what was the feeling and experience like for you to know that you've gone through that phase of transition you've you've had those experience you've put in the work uh did you ever expect that you would make your debut at such a young age? And and then what was that feeling and experience like for you? Um, firstly, I don't think when you each level you take a step up, you you're never quite sure whether you're ready. Um, and that's what the the eye of a coach is for, I guess. You know, you make your premiership debut, you're like, gosh, these guys are, are way too good for me. And then you make your test debut, and you're like, this is this is a different level. Um, the experience itself was was bizarre in terms of the how it all worked out for me. So, you, we, we I trained in the week, and when you're when you're with England, um, when when I was, you 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 train Monday and Tuesday. You'd have the whole squad, so that'd be like 37, 38 guys. And then on Tuesday night after training, you you'd know that like half the lads are gonna have to go home, go and play for their clubs. So you, you kind of sit there in your room, just looking at your phone every now and again. I, I didn't get a text, and I'd had a text a couple of weeks before, the two weeks before that. I didn't get a text. So I was like, that means I'm staying there. So I go for dinner kind of sheepish, thinking that someone had forgotten to message me. No, thinking kind of like waiting for someone to tap me on the show and say, you're not meant to be, you're meant to be you're gone. Um, anyway, so the rock up there and you kind of then, all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, you're right, mate. All of a sudden you're looking around the room trying to do the maths. You're like, there's one back row, there's one back row, there's one back row. There was five back rows. So I was thinking to myself, oh, I'm still here, but I might be traveling reserve, which is like you travel, you warm up, but you don't get to play. Anyway, the next day is like a walkthrough day. So my mum's like, are you playing? You know, should I be tri booking trips to Edinburgh? You know, who should I be telling? I'm like, I have no idea. Almost leave me alone. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm, my head's already in the in the hurricane, as it were. Anyway, Eddie tapped me on the shoulder, says, you're going to make your debut off the bench this week. I was like, oh my God, like the relief. I'd like, it's all been so stressed for like four or five days. Let my mum know. Then everyone's booking flights to Edinburgh and then all that. But it's it's like a mental week. It's like it's surreal, and I I remember very few bits of it. I remember like two bits. I remember first running on and just like the relief of like when you're on the bench, you're still not hundred percent sure you're going to get on. You run on, you're like, it's the pits if you don't get on, and all your exactly. families come all through. Your families there, like, <laughs> video, it's like it's mental, and I got on, and I just was like this, oh. and then all of a sudden I'm like, shucks, I'm playing in like a really tight game for England against Scotland. Like this means everything, so. Uh, that was a big overwhelming feeling, but I guess it kind of all sinks in afterwards. It was a, it's an amazing moment. Like it's, it's the pinnacle. It's the best to represent your country, at anything and to do it in the sport you love and to what you love is, is the best. And I guess what it does do is it like, it like makes you think about all those bits. Like we, we talk about loan club. It does honestly make you think like the whole journey. You're like, that was massive. That was a huge moment. That was tough, but I'm so glad I got through that. Like, there's been so many peaks and troughs even since then and before that that it's like it's just emotional you know it's awesome what um what was your experiences like with having eddie jones as a, as a coach because he's quite a like a, almost a bit of a larger than life character he likes to get out there in the media and uh, have his say what was it like being coached by him firstly he's an amazing coach no one i've met has got a better eye for the game like could see things happening before they've happened within the group within training within the game so he's an amazing coach. He's got some bizarre methods, but like they always got results, always got results. Um, and obviously I'm incredibly thankful for Tim for giving me the opportunity to play for England. I played for England 13 times under him. And, um, you know, I, I loved literally every minute of that. Um, he, he's an amazing guy and like he'll, he'll be an ex exceptional coach somewhere else. It's just a shame it's ended where it's at, how it's ended. But um, yeah, like I said, forever thankful for to him for, for giving me the opportunity and, I know that that sentiment is shared across the board. Mm. The the time you you know got to spend a, as a player under him. What do you think his perspective would be with what sort of happened now? Like, do you think he'd be gutted that he doesn't get the opportunity to to go to the World Cup? And yeah, yeah, definitely. I think you hear the narrative like that he wanted to peak towards the World Cup, and Eddie will get his best work done. And there's like a lot prolonged block before a World Cup. There's like a two or three month camp. Now that amount of coaching time with someone like Eddie would be like, wow, 
you'd get so much done as a team. You know, you'd be, achieve some amazing things. So yeah, it's a massive shame he didn't get the chance to do that. I mean, I guess some person's loss is another benefit. I mean, he might go to another nation now and be unbelievably successful. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that will happen. So um, look, I, I've, I've picked up in so many amazing things from him in terms of stories of people he's coached and and then the him actual coaching to me as well. So little bits like that are unbelievable. Fair play, Eddie. Um, what what are some of those bizarre things? That, uh, is there an example of something that was pretty out there that you can... Yeah, yeah. So like, uh, I remember having just made that debut we talked about then to coming back, um, came back into camp the week after and uh, training ended and he came around. He said, how many caps you got? Knowing full well that it was my first cap. I was like, one, you know, all that. Uh, he said, come into the corner. And sitting in this corner is like a five meter channel. You've got some cones along the touchline and a medicine ball, like a 15 kg medicine ball. I'm thinking this is bizarre, but all right. It's really muddy, all that weather. And uh, he, he picks the biggest prop in the whole group. And he says, right, I want you to score on that 50 meter, 50 meters away. This prop must weigh 135 kilograms with this 50 meter, 15 um, kilogram medicine ball. I'm like, oh my God. I must have been at it for 45 minutes. Obviously, I never scored. But like, and he's just like, so it's shouting. a five meter ten. Yeah, and I just kept getting bonus. Like, no, nope. back to the beginning. I was like, oh my god, I'm dying here. Like, I'm exhausted. I'm covered in mud. But like, it's like that. Like, but what did I get from that? Like, that I have, I'm nowhere near cracked it. I'm like, you know, again, you, you're only human. You make your test debut for England. You think like, right, I'm ready for more. I'm ready for more. That was like the biggest grounding, hum like humbling um, thing ever. And I was like wow, I've got so far to go. Not that I should be any good at that, but like that's, you know, that's the buy-in you need every day is like that, that relentlessness. And I just think that always sticks with me is like, and not like I look at it now, like guys who make their debuts for England or for their club. And it's like, you have still got so far to go. And, and like, even I now, like at, at my tender age, I've got so much learning to do, but like, that was like the big thing that I got instilled from him there. It's a pretty bloody good, like analogy for life because so many like the potential for when you get to a level that you've strived for your whole life like so many people may believe that like now it's all just going to unfold from there but so many truly successful people say the real work starts when you get to that point you know because now you gotta take it to another level to be able to actually maintain it I think everyone's biggest fear is to be that one cap wonder, isn't it? Like um, get that one chance and then it go. And complacency is just human nature. And, you know, you can either guard against yourself or have it guarded against you by someone else. And you'd rather have it by yourself than have that forced upon you. So, yeah, I think, you know, the great players that I've played with, the great people I've played with, they, they have that within them. Yeah, man, that's cool. Eddie Jones was bloody keeping a young whippersnapper uh, grounded, eh? <laughs> um Tell us about the experience of the whole um, Saracens with the salary cap. In, in terms of like the awareness stuff, it was just how things it's just how things were done, like at the club, and maybe that was the issue. And that's all right, um, and, you know. And like, I don't really, I can't really comment too much on it. Other than that, like the bits that happened happened, and like it's for the benefit of the people, and people have benefited from it in such a way that we, you know. We were cheating at the end of the day for whatever reason. Um, in terms of the experience, I just there's like a couple of moments that really stood out for me. We 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 came, we, we were during the World Cup, so we didn't really have many of our big names, um, and uh, we all got brought into a room very bizarre about half eight in the morning, and the CEO was standing there. And it's never really good when the CEO's in the club, you know what I mean? And uh, basically said, "Look, we, we, we've been caught." caught up in the salary cap we've had minus 35 points from our from our tally and everyone kind of looks around the room like oh god that's not great like whatever he looked at the league table and we were still like 25 points away from from safety and i thought well, everyone was like this is going to be one of the great seasons ever like we're actually going to go and be safe and you know the big that'd be the biggest f you to like the people that have given us this points relegation whatever and we went and beat gloucester that weekend against their their like best team and we we had basically a team of academy lads and, and we won and it was a, like an, a magic moment it's like one be one of the best moments then a couple of weeks later when they realized that we could actually guarantee safety we could like we if we won 80 percent of our games for a season we would have stayed up 
they then put another load on. So we were guaranteed to go down. And, and, and I think that was where it really hit home. And I think that was a really sad day for the club in terms of we lost some real servants to the club that year um, because they didn't want to play in the championship or it wasn't worth it or we had to offload some money because we are still uh, above the cap. Um, it was a tough time and like every person started thinking individually, which is completely anti-rugby kind of motto. Like everyone started thinking, what does that mean for me? And it was a bizarre time. And, and like the, the fact that the club has come out as strong as it has after a couple of years of um, hardship, as it were, it is testament probably to that culture that we speak about before and um, and the people up the top. So yeah, it was a it was a mental time and it was upsetting and it was uh, a tough a time that the club had to roll with the punches. But it was um, it was thoroughly enjoyable looking back on it now, being like, I'm so happy that that happened to the club. I guess it's another like character building and resilience building moment for you and your career. Like you got you bloody went through some some resilience building down there at Ampdale, and yeah. uh, you know got through that. Eddie Jones, bloody making you run it straight against props and uh, with medicine balls and then being caught up in one of the biggest um, sort of, I guess, scandals in modern Definitely. day rugby. Uh, it's probably created a, a, a resilience and a, and, a, and a mindset that hopefully has served you for the rest of your career. I think what that last bit has done is it's like the people that are left who, are, who had experienced that at the club, the tightness of that group, I can't say how tight it is. And what one thing they can't do in terms of you know we had the year in the in the championship we had the fine we had the 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 repayment stuff they can't take away the memories and like the memories that we had as a club over that year that we were found to be cheating whatever is 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 incredible and that you know you can't take those away and that that's still what's pretty special as a group. It's a tough one from my perspective. Like I try I try to like look at things from as many different perspectives as I can possibly consider. And I'm like, if I was in that club, I know your time as a rugby player is so limited and you give everything. And very, very, very few rugby players earn enough money to set themselves up for life. Yeah, very yeah. few, like minimal. 2%, like, 1%. Yeah. Yeah. And if if there's a club trying to find ways to reward players, uh, my view is like, fuck, man, people, guys give their life. Our our bodies are never the same. I can tell you, I was a scrum half, man. I wasn't even a back row. My, I know for a fact my body is fucked now. Like, so I, I can't think, imagine yeah. what the up front. So I was a bit like, oh, yeah. I, I don't know how to, because you also think to yourself, well, other clubs are going to be doing it too, to some degree, you know? Yeah, I think, I think, Firstly, there is that. There is certainly, there was probably a bit of um, grey area with other clubs and the fact that Saracens had won as much as they had probably meant that they were going to have the one that got put through the ring. But I also think, and I, I do stand to believe this, and of course I would because I, I'm there, but I don't believe there was any malice in the cheating. It wasn't that we wanted to win loads. It wasn't that we wanted to 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 have trophy cabinets and I think it was the fact that like people were, were valued and like that's the that's the price the club was willing to take to like make sure people felt valued at the club was was with that and like maintaining a team is a big thing and like building that consistency and i don't know man like living in london is you know you guys are based in north london it's a fucking expensive place to be like some of it was around like property and uh yeah but anyway i guess there's all different perspectives to be had yeah and, definitely uh, i know those people who lost in finals mm -hmm. to teams that were found to be Cheating is all that was. I can imagine that's brutal. So you have to take, you have to look at both sides, I guess. Yeah, but I, I always say like, put yourself in those shoes. Like, you know, you got a such a finite window. So I almost think like the players can't be blamed, uh, but who knows? It, it's all open to interpretation. When you went down to um, on loan to Bristol, what was the the big difference, or what was like the difference that stand out to you the most between Bristol and Saracens? I think the biggest thing and over and above was the culture, like the cultural side of things. So like I, I came into a team at Saracens that had a very stable culture, a very established culture for 10 years before I even thought about arriving. Um, so that culture was almost self-sustaining by that point. So a lot of it actually was, isn't coach led at Saracens, a lot of player led. There's a lot of knowledge in the room, rugby IQ, emotional IQ in terms of where we're at as a group, where we're going as a group, 
Um, whereas at Bristol, it was a very new club, had a lot of new players, um, players that hadn't represented the club that long or players that hadn't played, played under Pat Lamb for that long, who was the, the director of rugby there. So I think it's a lot more coach-led, coach-led culturally, coach-led rugby, which has its pros and cons. Like, And, and it's something that maybe I probably struggled with a little bit. Um, I took what was at Saracens for granted I, I'm, and came to Bristol and it was a bit of a shock that, you know, you're having coaches stand up at every meeting telling you what to do at exactly what moment in the game off, what, off every bit. There was not much off the cuff stuff. That being said, we were unbelievably successful and I played with some unbelievable players and, and we made some unbelievable memories. We, we won the Bristol's first ever European trophy, um, made it to the semi-final of the Premiership, fi having finished top. Um, I played in that infamous Bristol ball game. Um, where we were some mental points ahead to Harlequins and, and managed to lose. Um, but like some of the players that I managed to play with, like having played with Semi Rondrada, Charles Piertau, Steve Luatua, Carl Sinclair, like Harry Randall, they're, they're mates for life. And, and I've got some unbelievable memories of being down there. And I think also I'm, I'm incredibly thankful for them for having me. I, I, it was the reason why I didn't end up playing in the championship I, I played in the premiership for another year and continued my development and I I think everyone who spent a year on loan in that time came back a double the amount of player they left which I think is testament to the league and testament to those clubs that took a gamble on us I guess I um I, I was my first ever professional coach was Pat Lamb so I played was coached by him for three years uh again like like you say with Eddie Jones, I'm hugely grateful to him. He gave me an opportunity as a 19 year old to play for Auckland and the Blues. My he was my first professional coach, so for me that was just like that's what professional. What I learned from from when I went into other coaching uh, uh, environments was that guy is so specific down to the finest oh, detail yeah. about every single element of the game plan, the structure, the strategy. His rugby IQ is, uh, along with Eddie's, is like the best. The way he can like plot himself through a game and like as a coach is is awesome. And I, I guess what it does do is it leaves no grey area as a player. You know exactly whether that was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And I, I, I mean, as player development goes, it might not always be the best, but God, it got results for us in that year. And, and like you buy into his system and you buy into his stuff and, and there are results to be had, I guess. I think, Again, I'm not I'm not the, an expert in this regard, but I, I do f I'm interested in coaches and the culture and the style they have because I I was always interested as a player, and then I and I also think it correlates to business now. And you look at some coaches; they're really good for like a three to five year period, and they're usually the coaches that are like they're overseeing everything, and they get some unbelievable results in a three to five year period but it's almost like they've got a shelf life because they 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 got every single detail that they're overseeing and a group can only stay completely brought into being coached in that way for a period of time whereas then they're a coach and, and so that's not a bad way like that's one way of coaching and and you usually see them go like so he did that with Connick and then uh, he went. He left and he went to Bristol. And I think Gregor Townsend is very similar in my perspective because he, he's very, he's a lot like Pat Lamb in every single detail. And then, for example, Vern Cotter's a different style of coach where he he will push to empower the players to make decisions and and create the game plan. And he'll provide like a really clear structure and culture. And um and they usually have like like look what he did with Claremont. It's like a long um lasting like dynasty almost. So, is what's your view? Like, do you feel that there are coaches that have that kind of like real overseeing, quite f hands yeah. on the reins, and then there are others who is like I guess a longer term approach. I guess when you're in it, you don't see it that way, and I guess that's because you see it week to week, but. For someone like that, like uh, I guess it's not only what they do then; it's like what they leave behind. So, like that game plan, that stuff, like that's the start of it, and then it's how it evolves with the players and as the players evolve and mature. And then there are obviously um, less hands-on coaches that are more about feel and are more about yeah the structure of the week, the structure of the group. Um, and I don't think there's any right or wrong way. I just think like it's probably what the group needs. So you look at the group and you're like, right, what have I got to, what have I got to work with here? Is this a group that needs to be 
you know, handheld pulled along every moment? Or is it a group that needs to be pushed into a room and just said, work it out? And those rooms, the, the ones that are pushed into a room, work it out, tend to have a higher rugby IQ beforehand anyway. So um, I think I, I've been lucky to be in both teams now and, and I've managed to take the good out from both, which I, which I love. And I now see the game as a lot of a broader way of looking at it. And you probably do need a mixture of both, I think. Um, because otherwise it just leads to frustration and of all the games now rugby is really not a game you can be frustrated at others at because you've got no position to play at the end of the day so that's the that's the big thing I think I mean it's cool that you've got that open mindedness and yeah I, I I just was fascinated by different approaches and that that was something that I kind of um, perceived from my time but that was such a long time ago with Pat but does he does he still have the rule if you get tackled out in a game you got 100 burpees on Monday money now I think it's money <laughs> I think it's money where well, you roll the dice and you see what comes up. Yeah, that was it's called the funnel. It was yeah. called the funnel when I was there. Yeah, he didn't like that. No, don't get um, tackled out. Man. What else? What other bits of genius? In fairness, there's some a lot of sense. Every pass is worth five meters in attack, so keep passing it, which, which actually was true. Like, I you mean, know, how there like, was one if off a line break, there must be at least two wide passes from the ruck. And if you're if you're a player that chooses not to pass two of those wide passes off a ruck, if you don't score, you're fucked. Like that was one of his things. <laughs> I was I think I was on the receiving end of that quite a bit, but yeah, no. It's like and like little bits like that, like you little pick something up and you take it with you, don't you? You hold it with you. So and it, and it's genius. He is a genius. Nah, he. You'll be hard pressed to find a more passionate dude oh, about it, man. Holy shit! Hundred percent. And what a player! Yeah, in his day, Jesus, yeah. great player. They used to the they used to say in Auckland, um, they used to talk about the old Pat because you know he's, he's very devout with his, his religion and everything now. But yeah. apparently, you know, he's got some good stories from back <laughs> in his day. Well, when you playing that Newcastle team, I think you had to. I think you had to come away with something. Yeah. Some good stories, I'm sure. Um, so we're gonna go into a few um questions so we're, we're actually currently running a campaign that's called uh it's about to launch um and it's our first campaign of the year and the reason we're running it is because 80 percent of people's new year's resolutions by february are out the window and what we're trying to do is we're trying to instill and empower and inspire people with knowledge and understanding on how they can implement habits and routines that allow them to keep their turn their resolutions into something that's just an ongoing habit. So I wanted to ask you, have you had to think about anything that you would like to implement in 2023? Yep, definitely. Got I've got two big bits. Uh, I want to go back to studying. I'm going to study again this year. Um, don't know what yet. I guess it's only the second week of January, so I've got a couple of months to find out. But it's certainly something I want to get back doing. Um, I just find it gives me more of a perspective of rugby, like, I finished my degree at what 22 21 and and really focused on playing for what three or four years now and you can find it's all encompassing it can be everything you think about good bad ugly um you tend to think quite a lot about it so it's nice to have a bit of perspective um and i haven't quite found the something else that can displace learning and studying and self-growth um and my other thing is to drink more water so that's always nice um I just find that I'm horrific at it. Um, I'm not like proactive with drinking. I'm tend to be very reactive. So as a sportsman, you're doing a load of running, doing a load of work, uh, even on your day off, you tend not to be very good at just sitting around. So, and like, I'll go, I need to drink water cause I'm dying of thirst here rather than like, I just need to keep sipping, keep sipping. Um, and I, so far it's going all right. It's going okay. Um, had a few blips, but no, like those are my two big bits, I think. Have you, so the way we're going to educate people of like, okay, yeah, you follow your resolution. Because I think a lot of people come in with the right intention and they're like, I want to improve myself. And they set the goal of like, this is what I want to do. And this is what I want to achieve. However, a lot of people struggle with the, well, how do I get there? I think, I think there's two bits to this. I think firstly, like getting, getting it done, I find easier if it's shared. So sharing it with teammates or sharing it with mates so like you know about Dan's stuff um I definitely think that's going to help because all of a sudden you become accountable if you don't have if you know that he knows about it you're going to be accountable you're going to be like how's that going how's that going even if he's not on it straight away and I think the other thing as well which is important is like even if you fail one day of it so say you want to eat 
X amount or drink X amount, failed, failed it. Just crack on. Like it's not over because you failed in it one day. Like, and I think a very quick people are quick to be like, I failed in it this day. I don't feel too bad about it. I'm just going to sack it off. Like I failed in it this way. I'm going to double down on the next day or whatever. Like the one thing I've learned as, as a, as a player, like one bad game, one bad training session, you know, as a, as a routine doesn't make you a bad player doesn't make you a bad person like just crack on just be make sure the next day you've got even more of an exertive effort of getting it done um and that's where like routine i think is huge and like all of a sudden it'll become second nature you do it for a couple of weeks it comes second nature like it's the first couple of weeks is always going to drag its heels and then and then it's like right have i now got this ingrained in me have i now got a way of this working with my lifestyle and, and i think that's always going to help yeah, man, I think what you said is an amazing point. It's a big part of the learning that we're looking at around like habits and routines is so many of us think that thinking that routine or habit or goal is enough. And But the way our brains work, like there's so much going on in our mind and in the world that you can't rely on it just being stored in your mind as being set as like, I'm going to achieve that. And... I, I always like question, oh, like people say like write your goals down or have it in a visible place or write your habits and routines down. What you just said there by sharing it and making it tangible. Um, I was learning something the other day, like, you know that when you get it like a new car or a pair of shoes and then you start to actually see that thing everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And it's not because that thing's now become more into more your life. It. It's because your mind yeah. is aware. Definitely. And so what your what your mind is tangibly aware of, it it becomes more visible to it. So actually like putting it out there into the world or writing it down in your book or, or sticking it on your fridge and saying, drink four liters of water today, that actually starts to ingrain it to become turn a routine into a habit so um there you go bro you you'll be running that in i'm on the way there. i'm on the way you'll now. be to, to the series team and <laughs> you know, have a little thing written on a drink my drink water, water. <laughs> give me a bottle of water now uh, your brain is actually just trying to be the most efficient thing possible so if you just do something day in day out your brain just becomes accustomed to it and it makes it a habit and a routine and it just becomes part of you so you don't have to think about it anymore. You just do it. And that's how habits actually form is your brain just trying to be more efficient with the things that you do every single day. Another one is what's a habit that you want to kick in 2023? Something that like has just been hanging around too long or you've um, come to realize that actually that ain't in service of me. What's something you like to get rid of in 2023? Well, I spoke to you earlier about it. It's, it's uh, turning my phone off after probably like a couple of hours before bed. So I'm tending to after dinner, I have dinner and then put my phone upstairs and go and like either watch TV in terms of actually like watching something, being engrossed in it, or just reading a book and dead into a few books at the moment. So a bit of a bookworm myself. So I'm on that at the heart at the moment. And like I'm finding that I'm I'm just so much more like ready for bed. I tend to get into bed and like if I've been on my phone, I get quite restless. Um it's always like I don't know if it's the same with you, but like I get into bed and like my to-do list is just growing and it's just swelling. And I'm like, oh my God, this is all encompassing. So phone off, probably like it gets to nine, I'm turning my phone off. It's it's either going upstairs or it's I'm putting physical distance between myself and my phone because I am bad of like, if I'm sitting watching TV and I have my phone, I will be on my phone because either someone's messaging me, I've got a message to send or what I'm on watching TV is just too boring. So I'm like, let's just put up my phone instead. So that's the big thing for me at the moment. What are you reading? I am reading a cool, I'm don't, I only read fiction books. I don't, um, I'm not a massive fan of self-help books or autobiographies because you can just Google it and work it and read Wikipedia and like get the snapshot version. five minutes. I found this sick podcast called founders and he reads the best autobiographies and he does a podcast to break down all the key things yeah. so that backs up your yeah so, you stick to your so i'm um, so i just read fiction so i'm reading a book called the gentleman in moscow it's like a murder mystery I, I love murder mystery i just think it's like it just resonates with me more i don't read romance don't read any other i just read like murder mysteries just like engrosses me more it's quite a contrast because obviously like you like learning and you like going and learning like properly and education and that kind of stuff but then when it comes to your actual reading of books it's more about fiction well, yeah i think so i think like i have tried to read self-help books in the past and like i just find like to get it you have to be so switched on like at the time you actually have to be like intensely focusing on the book whereas like 
you know, you listen to a story, you're just listening, you're passive. I feel like I'm quite passive reading a murder mystery. Like I can just like, fo like focus on the actual storyline rather than like, he's talking about something that he referred to in chapter two and you're on chapter 12. You're like, what on earth was that? Because that was like f 15 nights ago, whatever. Like I can't remember that. So I don't know. I just can see and picture things better in my mind reading like fictional books. I think reading, regardless of what it is, uh, in book form, is something that there's something this, there in it there's this something whole, there. this time that we're in this world that we're in where everything's the information's so readily available and snippets and snapshots and you can just watch you can get so caught up watching video after video on youtube or uh, a rabbit hole into the youtube you know, rabbit yeah hole. man like buddy uh don't go and watch um police body cams in america on youtube man you go down the rabbit hole that's not you'll nice. be done all the all, yeah. the all the car chases they're yeah, just crazy man. or like gore-tex membranes on uh youtube trying to learn about arcteryx jackets don't go down that rebel um <laughs> there's no danger yeah, that for you. Don't yeah, worry that. <laughs> i'll get i'll get all the info for you um but in this day i feel one of the biggest like uh things is that instant gratification loop yeah it's just you, you want i want it i can get it yeah Bivaru, fast food yeah like 100 percent. and i and i and i look back actually when i was playing rugby was the time that i used to read i loved reading and i used to read so much and i used to remember there'd be times i was sitting in the change room where everyone's on their phone or listening to music just reading. before again we're reading and like i don't know like some might it got to a point where one time a coach was like he thought that i wasn't ready for the game because yeah. i was reading a book and i was like bro these dudes always fucking on like tinder and instagram yeah. bro i'm reading a book but anyway the fact that they have headphones on means they're more clued in than me reading <laughs> yeah. charles dickens here but don't worry oh. i'll be fine but yeah. but the but see as i have become more immersed in pure sport and like my because as a rugby player you do have a fair bit of free time on your hands and in, in and around and after training on your days off but one of the th things that served me so well in my life was reading and i've lost i up until two months ago when i r identified actually reading is good for my well-being because it's one of the few things left in life where you gotta stop and to do it you got to be completely present with it and there's something rewarding about taking that time to do something that needs that time um so i think man like that's a routine that i feel if everyone could just read for 30 minutes a day it'll help your brain like slow down a bit more yeah. always before bed get it get it on it's perfect it's honestly so much better yeah um oh, wait, i got another one um what what's a what is a routine or a habit that you feel like has just served you so well that that's like a now like a non-negotiable for you yeah i've got a couple i've got um so i'll do like one in the week and i always have one before a game i during the week and i'm not just saying this because i'm on this podcast i've got like a massive routine i come down in the morning so i always get up at the same time even on a day off so i'm up at half six every morning come down flat white like a big pint of water pint glass of water and my pure sports that's cbd lion's mane and my cordyceps is my three bits um bang that in the in the morning that i'm now ready to like crack on with the day um and like i said that's off day or um or when i'm training and then big thing before the game is i've actually started doing breathe breath work like breathing um i've seen like a few people do it and i back in the day and i just wasn't keen like thought thought it like there's no way that would work for me but like I just find like if I've got anxiety before the game, I've got maybe something going on off the pitch that I won't help me on the pitch. Like get a bit of breathing work done. Um, like let your mind just go, just wonder, not try and like focus on the breaths. Like it's not like meditation. It's like breathing and letting your mind just go. You finish your breathing and like five minutes has just gone like that because you've just ticked off all your thoughts and like you open your eyes and you're like, I'm like so free. I'm a lot more light. So I like, and like I've had times in before games, like sitting at home when it's a night game in the afternoon, like doing some breathing and like I've ended up like, I've ended up like falling asleep because like you're just, your brain's just going. So I've had to start like putting timers on. So I've got to like, I've managed to get to like 15 minutes, just sitting there, like eyes closed, breathing on the sofa like this. And like, it just goes like that. It's honestly genius how quickly That's, time goes. That's cool, man. I, what, I have been doing a lot of research through this campaign and also just my own learning um, from changing career from rugby now into business. And they, one of the things that keeps coming up 
is the tra- is a trait that's in all high performing successful people is they understand the power of delayed gratification so doing things that don't have a reward right away in that moment but they know have a knock on compound effect to their performance or their well-being or optimizing their their life in some way um so it sounds whether you know it or not you're aligned to that kind of perspective with you know you're taking your supplements that without pure sort supplements you know some you might see benefits right away but a lot of them are about consistent build up and use uh it's identifying the things like the water the reading the um the breath work so i think if there's anything big part of pure source we're wanting to inspire people that like you don't have to be a pro athlete or like a bloody some type of like ceo of a of a publicly listed company to be an elite optimal performer like taking pride in your life and what's good for you is for everybody and it can help us all live happier and more successful lives so um man it's uh, it's actually really cool to get because i don't know sometimes you speak to pro athletes and it's a bit like oh they always want to come across that's just my talent Talent. yeah and i definitely think there are some people that are like so blessed they can just turn it on i'm just not like that really and then in fact i think so deeply about stuff when i don't do them so if i'm like say this morning i didn't didn't take my pure sport i did thankfully but if i hadn't i'd be like oh my god i'm gonna be off it today like you i then like think about it so deeply the other way of like how much is going to take away by me not doing that that makes sense three quick ones yeah. first one most talented teammate doesn't necessarily have to be rugby i would say um elliot daly is the most talented person i've ever met in terms of he is such a good cricketer never played golf before picked up he's left-handed picked up one of my golf clubs just smoked it down the middle i was like this is frustrating and he also never gets hangovers can't doesn't get them it's it's just so blessed and no one can drink more than him it's just it's just rattling he's just such a talented but such a talented bloke crazy (laughs) All right, most annoying teammate. Oh, Mako Vinopola. He is he is a, he's a the bloke's a genius, but he um he's really 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 strong, right? And he's he's always very sore and like you know kind of he puts his body on the line every weekend. Fair play to him. He'll come into the gym in the morning and like him and I we get along very well. And I try and spice him up a bit. And I'm like, come on, like. like Let's put something on this. You know, we're doing some squats or doing some jumps where they track the speed of the jump or the like the weight, your weight plus the speed is like a weird um thing. And I put let's put something on this. He's like, all right, um, you know, um fifty quid, hundred quid, two hundred quid once. And I said, There's no way he's beating me. Look at these scores. All of a sudden he gets two hundred quid on the line. It's like he's He's found himself again. And honestly, the amount of times I've had to pay, him, I am so far down in him is a joke. So I am, uh, so I've, that, I've stopped doing that for a while until I've got myself back up to where I need to be. Yeah. You need to get on him, but you seen the last dance with this yeah, the yeah. type of bits Michael Jordan was making? So like, you could, but like, I don't know what it is between teammates. They just hit different when there's a challenge between teammates and like, you're feeling pretty good about yourself, feeling pretty bullshit. It's like, oh God, my pants pulled down here. It's tough. You want to do the next two? Who do you reckon is the most underrated player that that you've played alongside or against? Most underrated? Ooh. I think, um, it's a good, really good question. Richard Wigglesworth with, um, to before he became a coach, was without doubt the best box kicker in the world. And that, like, what a bizarre skill. But for us, it's massive and... Um, he was always the fittest, always the loudest, but his box kicking and his ability to lead a group around a field is second to none. And, uh, and, and, you know, we dearly miss, we dearly miss him, but like, it's incredible to see him do so well on the coaching as well. Like, but my goodness, what a player and probably should have got more caps and he got a fair few as well. Man, I remember like coming from playing rugby in New Zealand, I would maybe do two off the cuff box kicks a game. Signed for Edinburgh and then Glasgow Warriors, where I was hoisting. You kicked like, the G off the Gilbert. That's what I'm saying. Twenty <laughs> odd box kicks a game. Mental. And I just remember watching Richard Wigglesworth make it look so easy. Put it on a dime every time. Like man, 
I could be rich if I could do that. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, well, exactly. But, That's but obviously, he was so much more than that. He was such a cool head. His like decision making. He's one of those players that he's a player's player, isn't he? Yeah, like, definitely. You know, it's a bit like Greg, Greg Laidlaw. Yeah. Like, obviously, a lot of fans love these players because they understand the game. Yeah. But like, it's the, the players outlook. that appreciate these guys he, the most. His 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 other thing that Wiggy was brilliant at was like he'd love to start a scrap and then he'd that classic nine. He'd be on like. He'd have run off and you'd you'd be fighting his fight and you'd look around and he'd be like, Where's he gone then? And he's like getting water. He's like, Hi boys. And I'm like, mate, where have you been? <laughs> Genius. Good guys to have. Um, who do you reckon is the best player in the world right now? Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. I'm gonna say the best player in the world right now for me is Ardi Surveyor. I think. I think he's as a bat rower and you look at what he has, he has everything. I mean, literally everything. I mean it's scary how good that guy is. Um, yeah. And you watch him play and like, he never has a bad game ever. And a quiet game for him is still like my eight out of 10. And that's like, it's incredible. I, he's a great player. And uh, I thought he was unlucky not to be in the, even the top three, never mind the top one. So yeah, he's, he'd be mine. He, he He's an example of a dude who, he's got so much talent. Yeah, exactly. But you can just tell how hard that, that guy is trying to get every percent out of his talent which like to me that's so inspiring man because that dude could have had an unbelievable career probably working half as hard as what he's done because it's hard to find talent like his, his, his and like athletic it's a scary family that though isn't it <laughs> man but yeah he's he's an amazing player man and especially like people know how good he is and he's still doing it like, yeah fun fact go on he follows me on Instagram. I don't oh, know why. Genius. If you're watching this, can you follow me? It'd be great. Thanks. Right, that's J JD's claim to fame. He comes up to me once a day. He's like, shows me that there's a blue bit saying follow, it's saying follow back. He's too cool to follow him back. You gotta follow him back. Where's your respect? Yeah, oh, it yeah, was no like respect, nine years bro. ago. Oh, no, I was like, that's my boy. I don't know why. I don't know why he follows me. That's so sick. Uh, nah, oh, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, we're we're bloody honored to have you part of our pure sport Thank crew uh i think the way you go about you know you, your mentality your career just the way you look at life is so aligned with pure sport and all that we're about so hugely appreciate having you on on the team and so excited for a huge 2023 uh here at pure sport we say we're here to tear 23 a new one and uh we reckon that's what you're going to be doing thank you thanks for having me i appreciate it